All right, well, we are about to talk on the topic of a second well-rounded excellence pillar, which is intellectual intelligence. Again, don't confuse it with the idea that all of these pillars we are discussing, they are supposedly having a particular order or they are more important than the other one. The reason that they are all important equally, although one might argue about the order of them, for your convenience you can do that, but they are all equally important because the whole premise of pillars of well-rounded excellence is the idea that you can become truly well-rounded individual, as in developed in various domains of life, as in being versatile, as in being agile and adaptable. I hope that makes sense. Now let's get focused on intellectual intelligence. What do I mean by that? Few examples, so what actually goes into this pillar is critical thinking. Again, there are lots of angles how you would approach what is critical thinking and the scenarios in which that will be applied as a skill. But one interesting scenario I can give you is that just imagine the last couple of years how many things on the macro landscape uh, across the world have been happening whether it's viral infections political changes you know worsened or improved the economy wars i mean you name it so the question is are you able to think critically and judge the information presented to you with some grain of salt if you're able to be skeptical in other words right how can you basically detach from whatever the emotion you feel and from the bias that you might experience right all of us can. Nobody can really fully separate themselves from any bias that they might have, but what you can do is completely limit it, right? From being 100% biased on a certain topic, you can be maybe 10% biased, right? That's a very big difference. Of course, I'm making up these numbers just to make the point, but you got the idea. So critical thinking, let's say somebody, and again, not going into political conversations here, just giving you an example, that a doctor would give you a prescription, right? Or, or a certain set of steps you need to take to improve your health in a particular area. Well, are you supposed to trust that doctor 100%? Are you not supposed to do your own research? Are you not to ask other doctors' opinions because you might have five doctors with different opinions because they maybe had different education or life perspectives or value system, which is another foundational pillar of well-rounded excellence, right? So are you not supposed to do those things? I would argue you should do those things. And the truth is, you only can do those if you ever even allow critical thinking enter your life, enter your way of, of just thought process uh, in general. Because if you just take every information that is given to you as the complete objective truth that is not there to be challenged, I'm not talking about being even paranoid, although one might argue, I believe one of the entrepreneurs, Patrick but David talks about this a lot, is that, and there is a book about it, in fact, being a little bit paranoid actually might be a good good sort of I wouldn't call it value, but good character trait. But whether it's paranoid or not, you have to be able to think critically. You have to understand the difference between quantitative and qualitative data. You have to challenge the data itself. You have to look at different perspectives, different angles, different lenses. You have to understand how a particular human is presenting the information, what their goal, if they have any agenda or not. And most importantly, do they have your best interest at heart? Because if not, then again, maybe you should question the information provided to you. So that's critical thinking. Another one would be effective learning. In this ever, you know, changing world, in insane fast-paced world, digital world, I mean, how can you even learn anything? Everything is just bite-sized, everything is all over the place, nothing is structured, everything is blown, blown up, you know? So trying to be effective also means being efficient and being a really fast learner. Now, when I said that there is lots of noise, I'm not saying you have to slow down. You do have to keep up with it, to be honest with you. But it's the way of you keeping up with it that defines your successful learning ability, right? How you learn a language, how you learn at school academically, how you learn uh, by yourself, like self-education, right? What that learning even means? Is it just learning the theory or is it applying it to practice? I definitely will advocate for applying it in practice because, hey, we all can love podcasts and books and and, you know self-improvement and all that but really if again like I'm talking in every video if there is no action all that means nothing 
And so effective learning is you have to be able to come up with strategies that work for you, for your personality, for your way of thinking, for your values, right? And also taking some universally accepted, scientifically accepted, presented ideas as to how to learn fast, how to sort of motivate your brain and how to create that framework that is truly effective and efficient. And that's again, part of intellectual intelligence. Uh, if you master these, right, that we are talking about, that's you are mastering the second pillar and you are closer to becoming actually truly well-rounded. And so problem solving, you have to have this mindset that problems is okay. In fact, the bigger the problems, the more opportunities you have to test and challenge yourself and improve your life. Of course, there are things like tragedies and grief and, and a humongous horror like wars and things like that. I'm not saying that some problems are not, you know, I'm not gonna wish every problem on, on, on every human here. I understand that some of those that nobody wants to have. But in general, in a daily life, the problems that we encounter, you got into a car accident, you lost your job, you have problem with your spouse, you know, you can't get a buy-in of your boss and about this project, or you have troubles with your kids understanding a specific life philosophy you want them to understand. I can give you 100,000 examples. The point is, you have to be able to be an effective problem solver. And the first step to even be a problem solver is, is having the mindset that that's okay. Problems are okay, they are there, the life, you can't ex escape them. Don't try to escape the problem. Try to tackle it right there and then. Don't postpone it because you will just create a more emotional bubble associated with that given problem and you won't to do anything then. You will be much more frustrated and anxious. So whenever the problem occurs, if you can postpone it, if you can deal with another priority and you are fully confident that's okay, then fine. But if you think, oh no, I don't want to have this conversation right now, but you know you have to like you know you, you need to, then please tackle it right away. Find a way to be a real problem solver, whether it's in business, career, education, your job, you name it, whether it's with a relationship, whether it's just daily life, whether it, with your commitments and alignment with your values, you gotta be able to solve problems. Now, prudent decision making, and by the way, all of these are interconnected. Again, we wouldn't call it well-rounded excellence if it wouldn't be all interconnected. That's the whole point of my research in this area that I wanna speak to you, I wanna fire up your mind and I I wanna you know, open up your mind to a specific framework and way of looking at things, right? You can be super cool with critical thinking, you might be an engineer and smart, but then you lack a certain area of how you would prudently make a decision in a daily life, right, versus your career. So you, you gotta understand how all these play out together. So when I say prudent decision making, it's just being able to weigh in on a specific situation in life, on a specific scenario, and make sure you make a prudent decision making. It's not always safest, you can take risks. Some people are more risk averse, others are not. It also depends on the context, what kind of risks we are talking about, of course. But then again, you still have to make the most prudent decision you possibly can. For instance, let's talk about physical safety. You know, you heard from your friends and you verify that with some search on the internet or of course use verifiable uh, you know legitimate sources like fbi information or something right that that particular neighborhood is not popular in a sense of safety right it, it, it's a little bit unsafe it's a little bit dangerous there is much more shootings happening there or or theft or you know robberies and assault if you know that why in the world would you decide to go there now I'm not saying you need to be terrified and scared. I do understand some people have no choice. They have very low economic opportunities and they have to live there and have to struggle with that danger. There are so many things you might encounter that forces you to go into that neighborhood, but Still, if you in a position to avoid that, instead of creating a real potential dangerous conflict that would be danger to your life, it's very prudent to not go to that neighborhood, is it not? I think you agree with me on this. So another example would be, again, if you're making, let's say, a business decision, right? And you have certain deals presented to you and you assessing the companies or individuals that you will about to do business with and, and you're looking at that this deal is, looks a little bit better, it's, it's a little bit more attractive in terms of money, but the individuals that presents you that deal, you're not very trustworthy of them. And then there is this deal where you negotiated as much as you could, but then it's not as attractive as this one. But the 
individuals who are there are more trustworthy. Of course, I'm making this scenario up and that happens. Maybe that company is smaller, they can't give you that same level of, whether it's a purchase of the business or merger or acquisition or you name the business scenario, right? But you 100% confident that they are more trustworthy folks to deal with and to do business with and to have better relationship with and have reliance on them. Well, maybe it's a little more prudent to take that deal than to take this attractive business deal that might end up being not going anywhere, might be jeopardized because somebody might betray you in that pool of people in the company you're trying to do the business with, right? So you just have to think, you just have to constantly ask yourself and assess, am I making a prudent decision? Am I weighing in on all aspects and all nuances that go into that particular decision in order for it to be prudent anyway. So strategizing and optimizing another area, and by the way, these are not all areas. Again, this is an introductory video on this. We will get into depth into in many other parts of the content that I produce, but strategizing and optimizing. Optimizing really is linked to problem solving, in my view, is trying to find optimal solutions because you can't always find solution that pleases everybody or every single nuance is, is counted for but it's an optimal solution again there are so many scenarios to give you here uh, whether it's a life scenario or, or something else but for example you are trying to move like you live in a specific city but you kind of want to move into a better city and you, and you struggle with monetary aspect like you don't have enough finances to move but then there is this third city so it's much better still it has better infrastructure you like it better than this the one that you are living in but it's not as cool and as awesome and as expensive as the other one that you are eyeing but you can't stay here anymore because you are losing opportunities to connect with good people and maybe enjoy life and create the lifestyle you want maybe Again, it's prudent and it's optimal. It's an optimal solution to move into this middle ground city, right? To move the city that is a little less cool than the other one you actually want to be in, but it's still a better place than where you are now. Now, one might argue, well, that's cool, but what if you just postpone the whole thing of moving, wait for one year and then move to this city? Cool, if you get the finances done, and, and you're capable of doing that, of course. And if you can be patient, no problem. But if the situation forces you to move now and you struggle ch to choose between two cities, you don't want to jeopardize yourself with too much risk so that you go to that city and then you fail miserably and then you go back where you were, right? So it might, might be an optimal solution and strategy for you to choose that city that is a middle ground between the two, right? Again, strategy, we can talk about chess, chess in life, your next five moves, your next 15 moves, your next 25 moves. I mean, strategy is so important. Personally, I research and strategize about literally every single decision I made, unless it's something very small and stupid that I don't wanna spend too much time on. But really, whether it's business or career or life decision or consulting with, with a relative or per person I care about or helping somebody or, or figuring out my health and fitness, productivity, I'm always coming up with a strategy that might work. How can I get this done faster? How can I get this done more effectively? How can I produce the highest possible impact and the result in the end? That is all strategy. Well, part of it is tactics, whatever the scenario and use case we are talking about, but you can't get down to the tactics unless you know your high level strategy and where you want to end up, right? Your destination, your goal that you want to achieve. Now, uh, and I always, is this getting a little bit longer video than I would expect it to be? So I'm gonna run through this really quickly. We talked about what intellectual intelligence represents. Now let's just touch a few points about the self-discovery questions, right? One question could be, what are my primary strengths of my mental abilities? Again, we, we are talking about basically, if you're talking about effective learning or critical thinking, maybe there is creative creative thinking, right? What are your strengths there? Identify what are your strengths and weaknesses, where you need to improve. Are you actually the one who always thinking critically or not? Are you skeptical at all or not? Like try to identify that, ask yourself where you stand on it. Now, how do I, how do I learn best? Before fi figuring out the effective strategy, you have to figure out how do you learn? Do you like watching videos? Do you like reading books? Do you like perhaps counseling with somebody? Do you have a coach? Do you want somebody to help you with accountability? Do you like to have a study buddy? Like what's your deal? Like how do you learn? And that will determine your effective learning approach, right? Then am I making prudent decisions? Again, ask yourself, look back in a couple of months, and figure out, were there any problems you encounter that are like, oh shit, I, I made a serious mistake here. Like that was not smart. That was not good approach. Maybe you were misalignment here. Maybe you're not taking prudent decisions. You're not making them. And the question is, how can you tackle that? How can you improve upon this? Now, a few exercises again, 
check out the ebook that is part of this course as well and if you're watching this on other public social media i'm gonna link to it but one thing is the most basic thing but people still don't do it everybody says it's so important to journal and write but everybody gets tired of the idea of structure everybody thinks you have to write every day you have to buy this expensive notebook no ladies and gentlemen you can create your own structure your own cadence you can buy the cheapest three dollar notebook in the world or maybe you can type on your phone in some google notes or you can type somewhere else on your laptop whatever so it's your world it's, it's your journaling but you gotta figure it out put things on paper put thoughts on paper identify all of these answers to these questions on paper try to find some regularity your regularity might be once a month not once a day but it's another way of doing some inventory check if you will right it's like checking yourself understanding your self-awareness understanding where you are are you still progressing with your intellectual intelligence or are you stagnant you are just or you're going backwards you are not doing anything that actually helps you here but actually in reverse makes you regress so mind mapping and decision trees another great example that's especially for critical thinking try to figure out if there is any scenario maybe it's a financial decision in your life or something else where and you can you can research how decision trees are made we will not do it for purposes of this video but ultimately it's understanding the probabilities you're asking yourself a specific scenario and then you kind of like having two or three variants of that specific scenario that might end up and then you put the probabilities here and then at some point you figure out where you stand right of course decision tree mathematically speaking that is in practice used for solving i don't know game theory and economy that's not what you need here you know you don't need to go into that depth although that you can get that exercise done to improve your skills but what i'm trying to say how can you apply these decision trees and mind mapping techniques to understand yourself better and improve your skills in general in life right finally debate in practice if you never debated anyone on any of the life philosophies topics politics economy i mean macro and micro even something you know in your daily life that is super small you gotta do it you gotta find a way to debate people are scared they think debate is all about insulting each other no no, no. debate is a very profound experience if you if, if it's done right it's respectful conversation between two or multiple individuals on a certain given topic where they challenge each other's perspectives and so if you have never never done this before too bad because we can then you know scratch all of this you definitely won't have any critical thinking or you know ability to strategize especially in a moment where you're tackling the perspective of another person again debate is is important whether it's about socio-cultural issues in our society in general or whether it's a small set of scenarios where you talk to your spouse well i'm not necessarily sure you gotta debate your spouse too often the point i'm saying you have to be capable of presenting your argument backing it up with certain examples and 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 data if you can if that given topic allows for and then challenging somebody else's perspective and maybe being open into changing your own which is extremely difficult because egos are involved emotions are involved but that's the nature of the debate right if you're not having a debate we can't get anywhere as humans together i'm talking about you as an individual but you still as an individual will interact with other humans so that's that's the premise all right so this is intellectual intelligence and i'm looking forward to describing other pillars of well-rounded excellence in the next video thank you for watching